So we're back from Ireland and I'm excited to share with you some of the things I learned and some of the highlights of our trip. We started in the southern area in the Dingle Peninsula and then we moved north. We saw Doolin, the Cliffs of Moor. We saw the Titanic Museum in Belfast, which is probably the best museum I've ever been to. It was such a sensory experience with really wonderful artifacts. Highly recommend it. And it's even more interesting because it sits in the shipyard where the ship was built and where the ship was launched. So you actually get to stand in that part of history. From there, we ended up in Dundalk and then slowly moved north. We saw Abbey's. We went to Inch Abbey. We saw Game of Thrones studio. We went to Trinity College in Dublin, which I'm a college professor. So that was so exciting for me to be on that campus. The old library, gorgeous library, something out of your imagination, I think. And they were doing something historical there for the first time. They're removing um, and cleaning the books. And so that was an interesting process to witness. Also, the Book of Kells, which is an interpretation of the Gospels that was created by monks in 800 AD and protected from Vikings and somehow lasted until today. And it's kept under lock and key in a dark room with a guard. You can go in and view it for just a few minutes. They have a replica that you can view for longer. But that was a really fascinating artifact. We had an amazing tour guide and he's such a great storyteller, John Fleming. He was also our bus driver. And John agreed to sit down with me and talk to me about Ireland's language and history and culture. So you're going to hear from John in a little bit. One of the reasons that I really had a desire to go to Ireland is because, and probably like many of you who listen to this, my background is Scots-Irish. My DNA profile is Scottish, Irish, and Welsh, and English. So pretty certain that my ancestors came from, from Ulster. Looking for those connections is something that I find fascinating, but also as someone in discourse studies who studies language, I really wanted to to pay close attention to words and pronunciations and see if I could pick up any connections there. The late Michael Montgomery was the foremost authority on Appalachian dialects. And in his book, From Ulster to America, The Scotch-Irish Heritage of American English, he talks about the research he did. He spent years in Ulster, in Ireland and Scotland, studying language and looking for the connections to Appalachian Englishes, the Scots-Irish connections. And he makes a case for the Scots-Irish connections being so much stronger than any other language because the sheer numbers of people who immigrated from Ireland, most of them came from those northern colonies, from the plantation colonies where Scots were given lands to live among the Irish. And generations later, you have the Scots-Irish. So the sheer numbers of people who came to Appalachia from through the region known as Appalachia came from that area. You also have Scots Gaelic included in that because of people coming across the Irish Sea from Scotland to Ireland. Patterns of migration, the sheer numbers of people. In this book, he indexes 400 terms that can be linked to, to the Scotch-Irish. One of the terms that he starts with, he talks about is hillbilly. And it's really interesting that sort of in the beginning of my trip, Ennis, one of the cities that we visited, the, one of the first things I saw was a restaurant called Hillbillies. And I posted a picture. I'll include pictures on the YouTube channel. But... Um, hillbillies in Ennis. And so I went straight back and I asked John about hillbillies and he, he sort of laughed and he said, that's probably an American who opened that restaurant here because it's not really a word that you hear very often. Hillbillies 
uh, according to Montgomery, is probably an American construction, but it does have actually English roots because he says that Billy is a Scots word meaning fellow or comrade known to have been brought by Ulster immigrants to Pennsylvania. And Billy is short for Billy Boy or a follow, follower of King William III. So he cites Ian Adamson in his book, um, who says, although the Scotch-Irish were merging quickly into the American nation, the Ulster speech itself was to stay alive in the hill country of Appalachia and beyond, where Scotch-Irish traditional music may still be heard. Among the earliest songs were ballads of King William of Orange, so those who sung them became known as Billy Boys of the Hill Country or Hill Billies. And so I asked John how he would define a hillbilly. And he said, well, and he sort of laughed and said, we would think of it as an eccentric person, maybe, who sort of keeps to himself. It's not a big issue. It's, it's not just, a big no, issue. It's not. It's more of a joke than anything. We were on a bus, which will explain the background noise in the audio. And we were talking about dual pronunciations of a Northern Ireland city, Londonderry, also known as Derry. How you choose to pronounce it, Derry or Londonderry, tells the listener about your religion and your politics. So I started my conversation with John by asking him about the history of Derry, Londonderry. People call it Derry because it was known as Derry before it was known as Londonderry. Because only when uh, back in the 1600s, when you had the plantation of that area with English people, they wanted to develop the best. So they provided, the people in London provided the money. So they decided to call it London Dairy. So the people that sit in Northern Ireland call it London Dairy. They are most likely Protestant, right? And the Irish people. Southern Ireland and the Catholic communities in Northern Ireland call it Derry. That's his negative religion. That's the, that's the official reason. John said that the signs in Northern Ireland say London Derry, and sometimes people will draw a line through the word London. They can joke about it in Southern Ireland, he says, because they didn't live through something known as the Troubles, quote unquote, as those in Northern Ireland did, a violent period of conflict that lasted for 30 years with political and religious roots. As for the name of the city, there's another option that seems more like a compromise. Another name they call it is Derry, Stroke, London Derry. As if, if we were writing it down, you could write it down, Derry, uh -huh. dash, I asked John how the differences in the North and South are heard in language. He said the accent was stronger and more direct. But he also said I'd begin hearing a word more common in the North. See, in Northern Ireland, they never say small. They call it we. A we instead of small. We. That's funny. So if you're going to the shop or something like that, then they'd say that's a we. Now, there are a few places, including parts of Belfast, where Irish is spoken, but most people speak English. England ruled the whole of Ireland from about 12th century to 20th century, so English was the national language. In the 1911 census, John told me, there were many people who spoke Irish, but by the 1920s and 30s, most spoke English because Irish wasn't allowed to be taught. Today, there are programs and opportunities for students at all levels to learn Irish. John tells me there are some who believe it's a waste of time to learn a language that can only be understood in Ireland and that kids should be learning German or French, while there are others who believe in its preservation. The government is even on board offering perks for those who want to learn and preserve the language. So students in their last year of national school or first year of college can go live with an Irish-speaking family to become fluent. It seems to be more about preserving this part of the culture. And that's the issue some people have, John says. The only people who need it are those who want a government job. But you see the way the Irish language is promoted in museums and signs and even the newspaper where Irish is there right alongside English. Accents and attitudes in Ireland are similar 
to those in the States, John says. The Northerners are considered more serious than those in the South, and the accents are different. He calls the accents in the North stronger. It made me think of that awfulness that we have in Appalachia, where you'll hear some people say, Warsh for wash, or yeller for yellow, or winder for window. That awfulness is something that you would describe as a strong part of our accent. And so I told him the story of very recently Zooming with some medical students from UVA in Charlottesville. And I'm occasionally asked to do these workshops because hospitals, doctors, and students want to be able to communicate effectively with Appalachian patients that have very distinctive Appalachian vernacular spoken dialects. And so they need to be familiar with the grammar and the vocabulary and the phonetics of the dialect. So I was Zooming with these students and I said, one of the words, one of the variants that you might hear is the awfulness as in warsh. And in Appalachia, they'll add needs to it. So you'll hear the car needs washed or, you know, something needs washed. And a woman spoke up in the, in the Zoom and she said, I'm from Belfast and we say that. I never knew we had anything in common with Appalachia. We say the car needs washed. So that might be an example of one of the ways that the, the accent is considered more distinctive in the North. Those of you in my Facebook and Instagram communities might remember a phrase I posted a while back, point blank, but it's often referenced as pint or pine blank. So there's a phonetic connection here. Listen to what John has to say. If, if I'm speeding, I get penalty points. People don't get the points. I have to spell it out. P-O-I-N-T-S. Now, something I saw a lot of in museums and imprinted on jewelry, OAM writing, O-G-H-A-M. It is considered a primitive version of the Irish language, and it's a Pictish language. It's visual. You see it carved on stone monuments. It was also carved on wood, and it In its simplest form, it has four sets of strokes or notches, and each set has five letters, giving it 20 letters. It's called a Pictish language because it was spoken in northern Scotland and then replaced by Gaelic in the ninth century. Known as, and I absolutely love this, the Celtic tree alphabet. Individual letters are associated with the names of various trees. Each letter corresponds to a specific tree or shrub. Here's what John had to say about Owen. I drive back there across the way from your bed and breakfast in, in Dingle, who was a jeweler, and he did what they call Owen writings on jewelry. And that was writings that were done back in the 5th and 6th century. There were lines that were drawn that represented letters in the alphabet. It's done in strokes, right? So you wrote the strokes. And that's the Celtic, that's the the roots of Irish. Yes, it would be dating back 5th and 6th century. And so I saw stone monuments in Dublin, in the museum in Dublin, the Archaeological Museum with lots of inscriptions, these strokes, these Owen strokes. And you see it in pieces of jewelry, in jewelry shops.
I enjoyed, I just enjoyed the scenery. The, the fields were the greenest green and the stone fences bordering the pastures. I remember thinking that when we were in the countryside and I was looking at the fields and the cows, and there's so many sheep, sheep everywhere. Um, but I was remember looking at those fields and thinking that reminds me with, and the hills beyond the fields that it reminded me of my home County, Lee County, Virginia, when you're going from Lee County down towards Cumberland Gap, it's, it's not as green as Ireland, but it looks, you know, the landscape just looks very much like the Irish landscape. I don't think we had one bad meal. Every meal was in every part of Ireland that we were in was so good. Loved fish and chips. We had all the fish and chips we could possibly eat. And it was wonderful. The service was wonderful. But everyone is so friendly. We just did not encounter anyone who wasn't, didn't seem happy to see us. And that's not always the case when you travel. So it was really nice. No. Coming into the towns and the cities, you'll see signs that say, Cape Mila Fawlton. That yeah. means 100,000 windows. Or leaving the town or the city, you might see a sign that says, Fawlton. That means welcome. Or, or it might say, Slaw, which means goodbye. Mm -hmm. As we moved through the countryside, John showed us a waterway, like a channel, where people would board boats during the Irish potato famine, known as the Great Hunger. From 1845 to 1852, it's estimated that a million people died from starvation and disease, and a million more fled the island, many of those to North America. So I tried to think about the people on those boats, leaving home and family behind knowing they probably never see its shores again. There are memorials everywhere for those lost to the famine, but probably the most heartbreaking stories I heard were told on a tour of Kilmainham Goyle Prison in Dublin with its thick, cold stone walls and rusted locks where women and children were imprisoned for stealing food. The youngest prisoner there was just three years old. Statues in Dublin still bear the scars of bullets from the Easter Uprising of 1916, and 16 people who organized that uprising were executed there at the prison. Belfast Graffiti memorializes the Troubles of 1968 to 1998. Ireland is resilient and proud and carries on. It's beautiful and traditional and historical. And for this woman from Appalachia, it felt like a return, though I'd never been there, and I can't wait to go back. You know, a lot of what I talk about on this podcast has to do with preservation, preservation of culture, language is a big part of that, preservation of story, preservation of things that will pass away with older generations if younger generations don't continue to talk about them. So the next few episodes will be about that theme. Tomorrow, I'm really excited to be joined by Michael McDermott, who is the co-director of a documentary called We Will Speak about the Cherokee language and the fight to preserve a language that would otherwise be extinct. Younger people are learning to speak the language from the elders and they're creating programs. So I'm really excited to be talking with him and to share that episode with you in a week or two. And it's really interesting that I was in a country where they are fighting to preserve their language as well. Then I come back and I'm talking to the director of a documentary about the same thing. Appalachian dialects, that's not a whole other language but it has its roots in these languages and the dialects themselves have really important features that are only being spoken by older generations now. So all of this is important because language is the pillar, one of the key pillars of a culture. 
And a lot of times what happens to a language when it's leveled or when it starts to die out, that happens, well, history shows us that it happens because people are marginalized. People are uh, not allowed to speak it, not allowed to use it, not allowed to learn it, and you know passes out of existence. And that's what people who try to eclipse a language are doing. A lot of what I've learned about language has to do with power, who has it and who doesn't. And language itself is such a is such a significant part of who we are as humans, the ability to communicate, but not just communicate, the way that our culture is embedded in the words that we use and the way that we pronounce them. So that's why this is important to me. And I hope you'll continue with me on this journey. So subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so that you'll be alerted when a new episode is dropped. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. One of my goals this summer is to go back into the podcasts that are already on YouTube and add photography there that I've taken alongside the subject matter. Go to our Patreon page and subscribe there to get bonus content and early access to episodes. Join our social communities where you can engage in discussions, you know, following up on episodes, the content of the episodes. I've really enjoyed getting to know so many of you, and I love what listeners are teaching me. Um, I love to get ideas and hear your music and get book recommendations and travel recommendations. It, it, it's great to be part of a community that cares about some of the same things. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. Thanks to each and every one of you, because it all matters to me. Even if one person reaches out to me, it's, it means that somebody's listening. I also have, while I'm thinking about it, a recommendation for those of you that have Netflix. If you haven't watched the series, All the Light We Cannot See, do yourself a favor and watch that. It is it is the most beautiful story. The book, as I understand it, um, won the Pulitzer Prize. And so they've adapted this into a beautiful series that is so good. I've been watching it with my daughter. The story itself is, is beautiful, especially if you're interested in history, if you're interested in books, if you're interested in broadcasting and things like that, you'll really enjoy the series. So that's my recommendation for this week. We are about to get snow in April in the mountains, and that's mountain weather for you. So if you're in the mountains, stay warm. Summer's coming. Spring's coming back. And I look forward to the next episode. 